So far, we've learned to describe kinetics, the relationship between forces and motion through Newton's second law. But there are a couple of other methods, uh, techniques we can use to relate forces and motion. And the first one is based on work and energy. Uh, suppose we have a particle at point A, and it moves to some point A prime that's nearby. Right? And the displacement in going from A to A prime is dr, and during its motion it's acted upon by this force F. Uh, we can define the differential work. We can define the differential work du as the force vector dotted with the differential displacement, F dot dr. Now, if we refer to the magnitudes of these two, as F and DS. Now, we're going to use DS when we discuss work to highlight the fact that when a particle is undergoing motion, for example, the motion dr, the path that the particle follows is important. So the length that, the dis that this uh, particle travels may not be the same length as the vector dr. It may follow some arbitrary path, like the one I just drew, or any other path. And the length along that path we're calling ds. Right? So this highlights the fact that the motion along the path is the important thing to consider. So if the magnitudes are f and ds, and the angle between the force vector and the differential displacement dr is this little angle alpha, then we can write the scalar work du as being f ds cosine of the angle. Okay. So a way of interpreting this is to say that the work is equal to some component of force times the displacement. So this is probably a notion you're familiar with, the concept that work is force times displacement, but it's a little more subtle than that. Uh, we can express the work, the differential work du, which is f dotted with dr, in rectangular coordinates as f dx. So in rectangular co coordinates, it's the component of force in the x direction dx, f sub y dy, and f sub z dz. Okay. And also note that the work is a scalar. So we're not dealing with vectors now when we get eventually get to the concept of work. Okay. A word on units when it comes to work. Okay. In the US system, the units are the foot pound or sometimes you see inch-pounds. So a force times distance like unit. All right. In the metric system, the units almost exclusively the Newton meter, which is equal to a joule. Now something else to note, back to our expression for this, uh, the work done. Um, first of all, if the angle is uh, greater than 90 degrees, right, then du will be less than zero. The work will be negative, okay? If alpha is greater, um, excuse me, less than 90 degrees, then the work is positive. And if alpha is equal to 90 degrees, right, the cosine term is zero, and the work is zero. Well, this is all very interesting, but we're really interested in the work over a finite distance. So let's draw our particle moving from this point along a path, moving from A1 to A2. Okay. 
And as it moves along this point, it's acted upon by the force F. Uh, here's our angle alpha. Okay. So the finite work, the finite work is found by integrating our expression along the path, and more on that what that means in a moment. So we had already had du equals f dotted with dr. And so we're going to integrate that expression like this, and we write the limits of integration as a1 to a2. And this integral, that's a very important part of it, the integral is done along the path that the particle follows. Now, sometimes this is not a trivial thing to do, to find the path and integrate along it, but in many cases it is relatively straightforward, and we'll deal with those cases in a moment. Okay? But again, the expression f dotted with dr doesn't say anything about, or we haven't said anything about the path. But, you know, the particle could follow some convoluted path between a1 and a2 when we talk about the differential work. Um, and so we have to keep that in mind as we consider this integral. Okay? Now the integral, the left-hand side of the integral of du, we just call that, write that as u1-2. So the work done in going from position 1 to position 2 along the path. Now if we look at our com uh, dot product definition that we saw before, we can write this as the integral from a1 to a2 as f times the cosine of alpha times ds, where again ds is the differential length along the path. So I could draw it, for example, along a path like that just to highlight that fact. But I also like to point out that this quantity, f cosine of alpha, that's equal to the tangential force, right? That's the component of this force vector in the tangential direction. Okay? And that's an important concept when we talk about work, work done by forces. Really one worth remembering. And that is that only tangential forces do work, or only the components of a force in the tangential direction do any work. Forces that are normal to the motion don't do any work. And that's a really important concept to keep in mind when dealing with work and energy problems. So now we can say the work going from 1 to 2 is equal to the integral from S1 to S2 along the path right, of the tangential force acting on the particle times ds. All right? In rectangular coordinates, we can write this expression for work as the integral along the path, like that. So we can still split our force and direction, or dot product, up into its components. But still we have to integrate along the path. So, this notion of integrating along the path, sometimes it's um, difficult to do that. In several cases, it's straightforward. For example, let's consider a constant force. So, a force that's vector, doesn't change magnitude or direction, acting on a particle in rectilinear motion. So, here's our particle moving along a straight line, called the coordinate x. And it moves from x1 to x2, and all the time it's acted upon by this force. It's acting at an angle of alpha to the direction of motion. Well, we can write the force, excuse me, the work done from this above expression as the integral along these components. Well, dy is 0, dz is 0, so those don't come into the equation, but the F com the x component does. And the path is a straight line, so we're just integrating from x1 to x2. So that means that the work done 
is equal to the integral x1 to x2. Now the x component of the force here is just f cosine alpha times dx. So the work done in going from x1 to x2 is equal to f cosine alpha times x2 minus x1. So what do we have? We have that the work done is equal to the tangential component of force, that's f cosine theta alpha, times the displacement. Another case where the integral is relatively straightforward is when a particle is acted upon by gravitational force, its weight. Okay. So in this case, u1 to 2 is equal to the integral from a1 to a2. There's the general expression for work done in rectilinear, excuse me, rectangular com uh, coordinates. If this is our particle and it's acted upon by the weight. Here's our coordinate system. And it's moving up and down. Okay, so that means that dx is 0 and dz is 0. So all we have to consider is the y component. So the work done, the integral from y1 to y2, the force acting on it is the weight, right, and it acts in the negative y direction, so we have minus w times dy. And so the result of that integral is minus w y2 minus y1. So this is the work done by a, on a particle by gravity. That's well worth remembering. And also note that the work will be by gravity will be positive when the particle goes down. Again, that's because the motion and the force are in the same direction. When the force and motion are in the same direction, work is positive. If the force is in the opposite direction of motion, the work will be negative. There's one last case where the integral for the work is straightforward. And that's the work done by an elastic spring. So suppose we have a particle and it's attached to some elastic spring, which I'll draw schematically like that. Maybe it's sliding on a surface. And the displacement, we'll call it positive to the right, is x. A spring, or an elastic, a linear elastic a spring, produces a force that's equal to minus the spring constant k, I'll label that spring as constant k, times the displacement x. Actually, there's a better way to write this. The force is equal to minus k times delta l. Delta l is the change in length of the spring. Relative to the relaxed position. That's important when dealing with springs. So if we draw our coordinate system x with its origin at the spring equilibrium position, that means that the origin for x is the position of the particle when there's the spring uh, is not under tension or compression. There's no force in the spring. If I draw my origin that way, then I can write the force in the spring as minus k times x. Keep in mind your origin whenever you're writing these expressions for work done by springs. Okay. Uh, incidentally, the spring constant has units of newtons per meter force per length. Right? or 
pounds per foot or pounds per inch or something like that. Well, if that's the force that's uh, exerted by the spring, then the work is equal to the integral of minus k times x dx. That's the force times the displacement and we're moving in a straight line so the positions are x1 and x2. And the result of that integral is so this is the work done by an elastic spring. Once again remember the origin for X has to be the relaxed position of the spring. So in this case, U will be positive. The work is positive when the absolute value of the finished position is less than the absolute value of the beginning position. Okay. So that means that the spring is returning to its relaxed position. So that's the work done by a spring. Uh, there's one more case and that's the work done by the gravitational force. Let me move to this new page. There's one more case where the integral is relatively straightforward and that is the work done by the gravitational force. And you'll remember the constant G, m times m, the product of the two masses divided by r squared, where r is the distance between the two mass centers. So let's suppose we have one, the big M, and let's assume that it's not moving, it's motionless. And little m is moving. And suppose little m is moving along this path, okay, this curved path. Now we know that the force, the attractive force that's exerted on little m, right, is directed towards the center of the larger mass. Okay, and let's assume that it moves from, from a position of a to a prime, so the change in displacement dr in the radial direction is positive. Then we can say, remember, du is equal to, will in this case be equal to minus f times dr. And that's equal to minus g big M little m over r squared times dr. So that's what we have to integrate. So in this case, that's the integral we do. We don't have to worry about integrating along the path in this case because remember we're only interested in the tangential force. The normal force doesn't do any work. And so the result is that the work done by the gravitational force. So that's another result worth remembering. And so these are just expressions for work. How much work are these various forces? Gravitational force, uh, spring force, the work by gravity, the work by a constant force. Now we've come up with expressions for all of the ways of doing work, or a few of the ways of doing work. Now let's look at how we can put this to use in terms of uh, relating the work done to the motion of a particle. So suppose we have a particle moving along a path from position A1 to A2 and as it moves along it's acted upon by a force. And we can look at the components of that force in the tangential and normal directions like that and here's our angle alpha. 
So if this particle has a mass of m, we can write Newton's second law. We can write Newton's second law in terms of the normal and tangential components. So we know the tangential force will equal the mass times the acceleration in the tangential direction. Right? And that's equal to the mass times dv dt, right? where v is the speed. Now note that the velocity we can write as ds dt. Again, we're using s because it's the motion along the path, the distance along the path, if you will, that it moves to calculate the velocity. So if that's true, we can write our uh, Newton's second law equation as follows. Like that. All I've done now is multiply this equation by ds over ds. Right? So I'm multiplying by 1. But we know that ds dt is just equal to the velocity. Right? So that equals mv dv ds. Right? I can rearrange this. Like that and I can integrate along the path. So I can integrate like that. Well, I think you'll recognize that the left-hand side, this is just the work done and going from one to two. That's the work that we defined earlier. And we only need to worry about the tangential force because we know that the normal force doesn't do any work. The second, the right hand side, that integral results in the expression. So the left hand side recognizes the work. The right hand side, you may recognize this as an expression of kinetic energy. And in fact, that's the kinetic energy of the particle uh, whose velocity is v2. We can define the kinetic energy, we'll call it T, it's just equal to one-half mass times velocity squared. So if that's the kinetic energy, then the equation we saw a moment ago, the integration that we did, looks like the work done going from one to two is equal to T2 minus T1. Which says that the work of a force, that's the left-hand side, is equal to the change in kinetic energy. More commonly, we see it written the following way, like that. And that expression is called the principle of work and energy. It says that the work done from the previous equation, the work done equals a change in kinetic energy, or that to move a particle from one kinetic energy to another, you need to do work in the amount of u1 and 2. And this is a very useful expression in relating forces and velocities. But another thing to note about, though, is the principle of work and energy um, relates to a process, right? We're going from one condition to another, and in that you know, we move through space and time evolves, as opposed to Newton's second law, which just relates to an instant in time. So this is all about a problem. Uh, principle of work and energy can be quite useful um, in a lot of problems. PWE, principle of work and energy. First one is if it's velocity or after, you don't have to go through the acceleration and integration to get the velocity. It relates directly to velocity. Second, all the quantities in the equation are scalar, right? The work is a scalar, the energy is a scalar. You don't have vector components to worry about nearly as much. Another advantage is that forces that don't do work are eliminated 
from the whole problem. You don't even have to worry about them or consider them at all. For example, normal, normal forces don't do any work. On the other hand, uh, you can't learn anything about forces in the normal direction either. So if you want to find something out about normal forces, you're going to have to eventually go to Newton's second law to figure it out. If you have a problem with more than one particles, you know, two blocks connected by ropes and pulleys, something like that, then you need to write the expression of principle of work and energy for both of those independently. You have to write two expressions of principle of work and energy. Okay? But something interesting to note The work done by internal reaction forces cancel. Let me give you an example of that. Suppose you have two blocks connected by a rope and they're sliding along the ground. Both of them is going to, are going to be acted upon by the tension in the rope. Right? They are each act, each act upon by the same force, but the force is in the opposite direction each time. And presumably as these move, they will move an equal amount. So the work done by each force, these two forces, these two forces being internal reaction forces internal to the system, the forces are equal and opposite, the displacements are the same, so the work will be equal and opposite. So these internal reaction forces, like that in a rope, the work done by those will cancel out. Suppose we have a body moving along this curved path and it has a weight of W. And so at this position it's at an elevation Y1. Here it's in between some arbitrary elevation Y and it finishes at some elevation y2. So here we have it moving in a gravitational field from position a1 to position a2. Right. Then the work done by gravity in this case we already found is equal to the weight times y1 minus the weight times y2. Right. And something further to note, an important thing, is that this work is independent of the path. The work done by gravity, it doesn't matter what path it follows. It doesn't matter whether it follows the one I've shown or this one or any other path. All that matters is the beginning position and ending position. So that's important that this work is independent of the path. Right? Uh, when we have situations like that, we usually define a function, in this case we'll call it V sub G, which is equal to W times Y. And this we define as the potential energy. All right, potential energy is related to forces that do work independent of the path. Okay? So this is the potential energy for a body in a gravitational field. Right? And then when that's the case, we can write the work done going from 1 to 2 is equal to Vg1 minus Vg2. Right. There are a couple of other cases, coincidentally the ones we've already looked at, where we can where the work is also independent of the For a gravitational force, we found that the work done
looks like that. And so we define the potential function, I'm sorry, b sub big G is minus G M little m over R. That's the potential energy of a body being attracted by another body through the gravitational force. The work done of a body moving under a gravitational force is independent of the path. And there's one more case, that's an elastic spring, right? In that case, we define V sub E for E for elastic is equal to one half K X squared. That's the potential energy in a spring, okay? So we have these three potential energy expressions. A case where the work does depend on the path is friction. So for example, suppose I just have a block sliding along a surface. And it's acted on by a friction force. Okay. Then if the particle just goes from x1 to x2 like that, I'll get one expression for the work. But if it follows another path, suppose it goes down and back, the work done by that friction force will be very different, much more than the work done by the first one, okay? Because the path matters, right? So it goes down and back, down and back before it finally gets to the end, I'll get a different expression for work. So we don't have a potential function for friction work. So in the case where we have forces whose work is independent of the path, we call them conservative forces. The ones we will deal with in this class are gravity, the gravitational force to differentiate the two, and spring forces. Those are the three conservative forces that we will encounter in this class. So these, the work done by conservative forces can be expressed as changes in kinetic en potential energy. So the, exp the uh, principle of work and energy in these cases looks like T1 plus the work done equals T2. Well, if the work, if all forces are conservative, If all the forces acting on the body are conservative, then I can write this as the work done as V1 minus V2. Right. And if I rearrange that, I get T1 plus V1 equals T2 plus V2. This is an expression of the conservation of energy. This says, right, that the initial total mechanical energy, this is mechanical energy, we can have energy as potential energy or as kinetic energy. That's all of our mechanical energy uh, expressions. So this equation says that the initial total system energy has to equal the final energy or that the energy doesn't change. Energy is conserved. So conservation of energy is just another expression of the principle of work and energy right, in the case where the forces are conservative.